We're talking all things money, wealth, prosperity, money, wealth, prosperity, but particularly money, wealth, and godly prosperity. One of the tragic issues of our time is that we have two radical extremes of gospel, a greed-centered prosperity gospel, or the other extreme, a gospel that teaches you that God wants you to be poor. It's really interesting because people don't know that blessing is actually a Bible word. (laughs) It's a Bible thing. It's a God thing. And sometimes in our pursuit of rejecting prosperity gospel or some other extreme, you end up eliminating a character and a nature and a feature of who God actually is. And God actually wants to bless His people. And quickly, I want to tell you that whenever you talk about money, it's a really sensitive topic because it's an issue of conviction. I loved it in the Bible, the first sermon that was ever preached in the history of humanity was preached by Peter. And it said that, that the word of God pierced the heart. Can I tell you something tonight? God is going to pierce your heart. Money is a really, really sensitive topic. And it's a really sensitive topic because it's really, really close to our heart. So God is going to pierce, offend, trigger correct and rebuke because this is the issue about people with money problems is that they don't know it (laughs) greed is the invisible sin of the history of humanity it's greed is an invisible sin when you are greedy you don't even know it you don't even know it because it looks like you're just taking care of yourself It looks like you're just taking care of your family. It looks like you're just being wise, smart, strategic. Yet you're full. Full of greed. Full of greed. And greed is a serious issue. And and you know, here in Echo Church, we're all about equality. I I preach about homosexuality. I preach about drunkenness. I preach about fornication. I preach about every single thing. And today we're speaking about greed. We, we offend every single person equally. So if you're like an angry, abusive person, we've offended you somewhere. If you're into the LGBTQ stuff, we've offended you somewhere. If you're a gender bender, you want to change your gender, we have offended you somewhere. If you love your drinking and you get drunk every weekend, we've offended you somewhere. And tonight, we're offending the greedy people. And they tend to be in church a lot, by the way. They tend to be. Uh, greed is one of those issues that most pastors don't tend to preach about because it makes people leave. You, you, you touch something so close wow. to the heart and you touch something so close yeah. to the spirit. So I'm ready to offend you. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Echo Church, can I say, can I get an amen? Yeah. Can I preach the truth and shame the devil? Yeah. Yeah. This is the issue when, trigger warning by the way, um, this is TW on my Gen Z, trigger warning. I'm like what? The first time someone tagged me, like someone made a post about me, trigger warning, Andrew Sredder is a homophobe. I'm like, what's going on? It was like TW. I'm like, what's TW? I asked everybody. I went to Google. I'm like, trigger warning. I'm like, ah, oh, that means people can like harm themselves because of me. I'm like, what? Really? I didn't know that. I'm like, that's crazy. Um, I thought people were responsible, but they're not. Anyone, they blame the problems on someone else. But trigger warning because most people, most people pretend to hate the messenger, but in fact, they hate the message. And most people hide their hatred for the truth of the gospel by blaming a particular church, doctrine, or teaching. And you end up in a really dark place where you hate Jesus, but you don't know it. Where you persecute and oppress the body of Christ for its teaching, but you pretend like you don't love Jesus. So you're deceiving yourself and you're lying to yourself. A lot of people don't come to church because of the money issue. And it makes me wonder, I'm like, did they even know that that Christianity is not Christendom? We don't take money from the government. Christianity is actually (laughs) people-funded. Did you know that we don't go to the, hey, government, give us money. Hey, rich person, give us money. No, 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 no. Christianity is not top-down. It's down-up. Unless you want a state religion. If you have a state religion, then the government will give the church money. But that's not what Christianity is about. And that's not how the church was built. God changed people's lives and God transformed people's lives. And as a consequence, as a byproduct, people presented to the house of God, to the kingdom of God, the first, tenth, and best. So you get this extremely simplistic, naive, uh, foolish, and sorry, stupid people who make simplistic conclusions without any substance. The church just wants people money. 
I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Like, you don't even understand what church is. You, you, you don't get it. You don't get it. So they end up getting offended and triggered. And money is the biggest issue, apart from homosexuality, is number two. Who knows it might come number one? That people don't step a foot into church because people don't want to get confronted by the true condition of the heart, which is greed, the invisible sin of greed. And this is what greed does. God created us to worship Him, to love people, and use money. What greed does, it makes you love self, worship money, and use people. <laughs> catch it, friend, catch it. God created us to worship God, to use stuff, and to love people. What greed does, it makes you worship money, love self, and use people. And as a byproduct, you come to the house of God and you encounter the grace of God, but you still don't get it. That freely you have received, so freely you give. So if you're new at this thing, hey, I'm not forcing you to give. I know by the end of the sermon, you're gonna feel conviction. You're like, ouch, that's judgmental. That's called conviction. You're gonna feel that little tingly feeling. It's called the Holy Spirit. He's gonna come into your heart and convict you. So yo, yo, bro, you're greedy. You didn't even know it. You love yourself too much. You didn't even know it. You've been using people. You've been living for yourself and you don't even know it. That's why you don't tithe. That's why you don't give. That's why you work over the end of your life and declare that Jesus lowered your mouth, but he's not lowered your hand. Just like my old LGBTQ alphabet soup at this point of time, it's like, I'm pregnant. I'm like, you know what I mean? You can't get pregnant. I'm like, well, I think I'm pregnant. It's the exact same thing. I'm not greedy and I love Jesus. I'm like, no, no, no. Just because you claim something, it doesn't mean that you are. And so, well, we live in a really horrific time in culture and it's a really big phenomenon in the Western culture. Like I'm coming, I came from the Middle East. You can't really claim something that you're not. In order to claim something, you actually need evidence and proof. <laughs> Duh, we all know that. That used to be common sense, not anymore. But we live in an era where not just culture, but people in the church to claim to love Jesus, yeah. but they don't love the church. Yeah. I'm like, how? Yeah. How? Wow. Come on. <laughs> you claim to be a committed Jesus follower, but you don't give to the house of God. I'm like, how, man? It doesn't make sense. And, and people love, yeah. catch it. People love to claim stuff that they're not. Yeah. <laughs> From the LGBTQ community all the way to a lot of people here right now. It's, this is, by the way, not just a, a gay phenomena. Yeah. It's everybody phenomena. Yeah. Yeah. People love to claim something that they're not. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you claim to love Jesus, but you don't love his house. You claim to follow Jesus, but you don't present your first, tenth, and best of the work of your hand to build the purpose of Jesus Christ. You claim to care about what Jesus cares about, yet for some reason you're not building the one thing he died for. And the one thing he said that he's coming back for, a holy, blameless, and pure church. You claim to, to, to be a Christian, yet greed is living within you. Within you. So how come every time we find this idea of 10% of the Bible, we find blessing. There's a weird interesting connection. I want to talk about blessing, but particularly from the lens of tithing. Because every time in the scripture you see tithing, you see blessing. Yeah. Every single time. This word tithing and blessing, is, there's a weird, spiritual, mysterious, practical, God, miraculous connection between tithing yeah. and blessing, yeah. between the 10% and God's Abundance between open hand and open heaven, between presenting to God the first, the tenth, and the best of what you worked with your hands and seeing heaven open. There is a weird connection and mysterious connection in the scripture that every time you see tithing, you see blessing. I'm going to argue with you in a moment. Why do you need blessing? I'm like, well, I don't need God's blessing. Well, I will tell you why you need God's blessing, friend. Um, <laughs> You need it, trust me, you need it, you need it, trust me. You need it, you need it so much. You have no idea how much you need God's blessing in your world. You need God's blessing in your family. Come on, you need God's blessing over your children. You need God's blessing over your work. You need God's blessing over your government or they're gonna take your money in your house. You need God's blessing over your country. You need God's blessing over your business. You need God's blessing over your career. You need God's blessing over your legacy. You need God's blessing over your wealth. You need God's blessing over your net worth. You need God's blessing over your possessions. You need God's blessing. 
You really need God's blessing. So, 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 so why do you need God's blessing and how come blessing is not an option? It's really not an option because most people, they, they don't tithe, they don't give, they don't present the first and tenth to God, they don't honor God with a financier, they don't open the hand so that God can open heaven because they don't fully fathom or understand the first three pages of the Bible. The first three pages of the Bible are the most important three pages in the world, I think. I think if people read them, they'll be a lot more logical, you know? It's crazy. In page one of the Bible, God creates the world, male and female, duh. In page two, he tells the people, yo, I bless you, be fruitful and multiply and don't eat from the tree. But page three, we stuff it up. Like, it's so annoying. I wish like Adam, you know, stayed to page six. Maybe we know what was in Eden. But Adam was so good at what he does, just like me, good at stuffing up everything from the beginning. Like, it took him two pages to stuff up the world, two pages, two pages of stuffing up, two pages to stuff up the world and like 3,000 pages to fix it. Crazy, right? Like, stupid, like, oh, awesome. Next minute, sin entered the world. There is chaos. There is struggle. There is pain. There is suffering. There is sickness. And we jump in the book of Genesis. And the book of Genesis is a book of initiation, a book of beginning, and the beginning God, obviously. It's a book of pioneering. It's a book of God establishing the foundation of reality and law and order. If you don't understand the first three pages of Genesis, you don't understand reality. You're living in your own reality, and eventually you'll get depressed and get over it because you're not living in reality. You're imagining your own reality and projecting into reality. Um, oh, my leftist friend, can I get an amen? Um, so, so, what tends to happen is that so, so, so you jump into Genesis and God establishing the order and law and order of reality. In Genesis 3, sin happened, sin entered the world, and you jump into this main question of life. Why do you need God's blessing and why is blessing not an option? Why is blessing not an option? Why blessing is not some extra add-on that you need in life? Because I'm telling you, you need God's blessing. I'm telling you, you need God's blessing. And, and, and particularly the, the most repeated word in, in, in Genesis, blessing. <laughs> it's like God went to hey, Abraham, I bless you to be a blessing. I bless those who bless you. I don't know, bless those who don't bless you. I bless you to be a blessing to the nation. I'm like, bro, I get it. You're gonna bless him. How many times? It's like blessing exception. It's the most, it's the most repeated word. And, and that's the reason, because look at Genesis 2. Look, Genesis 3, sorry, what happened. You encounter that moment when sin entered the universe, when sin entered reality. If you hate life, if you're depressed, if you find life hard, if you find yourself struggling, if you find working and you're like, am I working to live? Am I living to work? Am I working to live? I don't get it anymore. I was working to live. Now I'm living to work. It doesn't make sense. It's so much. I work so hard. And the harder I work, the less I have. And the more I have, the less I save. And the more I save, the more I spend. (laughs) This is the reason you are living in this human experience. This is the reason you have government, politics, drama, left wing, right wing, everything. It's because of this moment that took place. So it said, it said to the man, God said, since you listened to your wife and ate from that tree, man, the reason the world is in itself is because of you. Since the beginning of time, men refused to lead. Men refused to man up. Men refused to take charge. And every single consequence and every single ramification rises on that particular verse that a man refused to lead, to take charge, and to do whatever. This is not a conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy. This is the moment when sin entered the world and all the consequences and the ramifications of sin, of death, pain, suffering, oppression, injustice, it goes back to a man refusing to lead, a man refusing to be a man, a man refusing to man up, a man refusing to take responsibility, and a man refusing to take charge. And all my feminists, you know, soy boy, men looking like LGBTQ friendly, uh, blue headed woman, like I'm a feminist, I'm a feminist, I'm independent, I'm Mrs. Independent, I need no man, I need no man. I'm like, honey, that's why you're depressed. You need men. In fact, in that text, wait for it. A man's role is to provide. <laughs> No, I know my fa- trust me, feminists, talk to my wife. It's a lot better when men provide. It's a lot better be- because they can actually protect you because they're stronger. Duh. They have more grit. You are better at raising kids, but they have more grit and more strength. And God created them that way to provide, to lead, to supply, to work, to make money, to generate wealth, to start a vision, to have a vision, to make a business. 
and you help them. Yeah. It's not as bad as the feminists told you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's why they're depressed, because they're trying to be a man. Good luck with that, you know? I'm like, bro, like how awesome, you get the provision, I get to provide. That's not fair. <laughs> but let's quickly back, it goes back to man refusing to lead, man refusing to lead, and the more this kind of fake narrative takes place of our culture, feminism, the more women will be depressed. Because they're trying to fulfill a role that God never created them to fulfill. You have single moms. And I'm not judging anybody walking around and you're struggling. You're struggling because you're doing a role that God didn't make you to have. And culture is telling you that's you, that's you. And the more you do it, the more you get depressed. And the more you do it, the more broke and you're alone. Because maybe two is actually better than one. Yeah. Two is better than one. Let's quickly, so man, make sure you work, make sure you're a provider, make sure you're a leader, make sure you're a supplier. Your job is to make wealth and to make money, to supply and to work, 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 work. To provide for your family, that's your job. It's not the woman's job, it's your job. That is your function. That is the reason God created you, to have a vision to supply, to start a business, to start an idea, and your wife will support. And if you still disagree with me, it's all right. Just meet me in 10 years. If you're still depressed, maybe the Bible is right. Actually, it is right. It's awesome. I've been talking to a lot of families recently, and they're changing. It's like there's a lot of change happening because people are realizing, oh, my gosh, feminism is so toxic. It's not funny. Like, it's crazy how many women are trying to be men. And it's so sad because you're setting them up to lose. You're literally destroying them mentally, emotionally. You're trying to, to engineer them to be something that God didn't make them to be. And that's why God went to the man. He didn't go, yo, woman, go back to work. No, no, no. He said to man, yo, bro, what did you do? And like, yo, it was my wife. It was her. And like, no, 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 it was you, man. It was you. So quickly. So why do you need God's blessing? And why God's blessing is not an option? Why God's blessing is a must? And why you cannot live your life without God's blessing? Why? Because our contemporary culture is under a curse. And this gets a bit deeper. Our world is actually founded on a curse. Yeah. Wow. This is the problem. People think, you know, I'm just working. You harvest what you plant. No, 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 no. In this world, you do not harvest what you plant. Wow. Yeah. You don't. You don't actually get what you go for and you don't simply get the money that you work for. No, 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 no. The, the more you work, you are living under sin. And that's why in Genesis, look what it said. It said, because you have listened to your wife, look at the curse. This is the curse. This is the curse. Because it said number one, the ground is cursed. You can dig, you can work harder, you can be smarter, but there is a curse in the ground. The more you work, the, the more you will struggle, and, and that's the reason there is a curse living in the ground. You're working, working, but there is something working against you, and you're like, well, how come I work, and, and, and the government wants my money, and, and the bank have an interest rate, and the electricity company wants my money, and the fuel guys want my money, and the insurance guys want my money. Everybody's after your money because the ground is cursed. Yeah. That's the reason you end up with really bad bosses because you can't understand that in order to make money, you need to steal from people. <laughs> That's kind of uh, smart. Bad people have already concluded that. If I pay people where bad, if I can get a lot of people, make them slaves, slavery. That's what slavery is about. So I'm making people work for free. So they work and you make the money and you feed them. So you're kind of making a lot. That's really the heart of slavery. The heart of slavery is not racism. Oh my God, people are going to get amen. The heart of slavery is stealing. Because the ground is cursed. So as a consequence, you need to exploit people and enslave them to work for free so that you can make more. And, and that's why I say in Genesis, so the ground is cursed and all your life you will struggle just to scratch a living. Again, this is the condition of your business. This is the condition of your reality. This is the condition of the work of your hand. This is the condition of our world. It's, again, it's gonna come, so the ground is cursed. You will struggle to just scratch a living. The ground will grow thorns and sizzles. By the sweat of your brow, you will have food to eat until you die. This is the curse of sin. That all the days of your life, if you're not under the kingdom of heaven, if heaven is not open, if you're not submissive to bring in the first and the tenth and the best of the house of God, you are not li longer living under open heaven. You are living in 
shut ground. And that's why Malachi said, bring the tithe. Bring the first, the tenth, and the best. We're going to be digging that verse a lot more next week. Bring the tithe so that there may be food in the house. And look what says after it. And test me now in this and see if I'm not open heaven. So you really only have two options in life. It's either you work the ground and harvest curse. Or you honor the Lord with your first, tenth, and best and live under open heaven. Again, I, 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 I love this moment of my sermon because it gives you a picture of reality. A lot of you, you're working so hard and you're not making much. The more you save, the more it goes, the more money you make, the more money you spend. And this is the reason if you're not giving to the house of God. And this is the reason if you're not offering to God the first and the tenth and the best you are living under a curse, God is not with you. That's why people have to steal. (laughs) That's why big corporations will pay you crap because... The ground is cursed and everybody knows that there's injustice, there's oppression, there's high tax, there is everything you can name it. There's natural disasters, there is problems. So God's blessing, it's not an option. It's not an option because without God's blessing, you'll work all the days of your life and you'll still be broke. Without God's blessing, you will never, ever, ever be able to build anything thriving, growing, and prosperous for God and for the kingdom of God. Without God's blessing, you work all of your life and it'll be taken away from you. Without God's blessing, you work, 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 and your kids will spend, 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 spend. <laughs> generation will tend to go by second generation. The amount of people I've seen that they saved and did so much and they're dead and their kid comes and they buy, sell the house and go to Europe. <laughs> you worked all of your life and your kids spend it in a week. How cool. You need God's blessing. You need the miracle working hand to step in your world and open heaven so as you work, you will actually harvest what you plant. And this is the justice of God is that you will harvest what you plant if you do what is good. That's what Paul said. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. So if you do good, you will get good. So Genesis is a book where God across the whole entire book is trying to reverse the curse. It's about reversing the curse. The whole story is God, and that's why the most repeated word is the word blessing. It's like blessing. How how can I save my people and how can I reverse the curse? Like God is the whole, it's like how can I redeem my people and get them out of that particular curse? And we kind of jump in Genesis 28 where we see uh, uh, Jacob. And Jacob is kind of one of my favorite story guys because he was dodgy. He was a a thief. He was dodgy. He was a manipulator. He was a liar. He was like a wonky man, but he wanted God's blessing. (laughs) This is the attitude of people that want to get blessed. You actually have to want God's blessing. Like Jacob was dodgy, deceiver, liar, manipulator, deals under the table. He was everything under the sun that was ungodly, but something within that guy that wanted God's blessing so bad. To the point that when God came to him face to face, when Jesus incarnated in flesh to meet him was face to face, and he was like, bro, uh, let me go. And he was fighting with God. And like, yeah, God was like, yo, bro, I have something to do. I'm getting out of it. He's like, no, 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 God, I'm not letting you go. And he, Jesus was literally fighting with him face to face. And he was like, no, 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 God, I would not let you go unless you bless me, friend. You need God's blessing. It's crazy how many people think that tithing is wasting or not tithing is wise and you're being smart and strategic, but you're living under the sinful curse. And that's what I look at what happened in Genesis 28. Uh, in this moment when Jacob encounters God, Jacob steals a blessing. He runs here. Jacob was dodgy. He was a thief. He was a liar. He was a manipulator, but he wanted God's blessing. And you're like, you know what? That's good enough. I'll work on his character as long as he wants it. Yeah. I'll deal with that. So, so uh, Jacob kind of encountered that moment. It said, as he slept, Jacob dreamt of a stairway that reached for the earth up to heaven. Wow. A stairway. 
Notice that there was a stairway from the ground all the way to heaven. This was a moment, you know, the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. May your kingdom come and you'll be done on earth as it is in heaven, as above, so below. This was kind of the same moment where God was giving him the glimpse of open heaven. This theme of open heaven is always found in the kingdom of God. As you open your hand, God open heaven. And, and again, in, in Malachi 3, bring the tithes in the storehouse so, this, so that there's food in my house and I'll open heaven. You encounter the exact same thing where God gives him a dream of a stair where God opens heaven. And look what God said to him, I'm the Lord your God. And look what he said, the ground you are on, the ground belongs to you. This is part of the blessing of God for his people. Quickly, the Abrahamic blessing, I'll go in in a moment. The Abrahamic blessing is for every believer. It's number one, salvation by the greatness of God. It's number two, walking with God. Number three, having or owning your own promised land. Number four, having many, many children. This is the Abrahamic blessing. This is what it means to actually be blessed by God. We've got feminism, the killing babies. Yeah, I want to be rich. I'm going to kill my babies. Actually, according to the Bible, children are a blessing of the Lord. And the more children you have, the more you're blessed, actually. So, so look what God tells him. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I'm giving it to you and your children. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust on the earth. Again, the more children you have, the more blessed you are. Children are a blessing from the Lord. This is the blessing of Abraham, that God does not just save you. God doesn't just walk with you. God will live, give you your own promised land from the world to you. God will give you a lot of children, but not just that. Your children will love and obey the Lord. And your inheritance will not just pass to you but to your grandchildren. This is one of the biggest issues in our Western culture that we're really good at making money, but not good at keeping money when we die. <laughs> look, look I, 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 that kind of verse I always asked said, Proverbs 13, good people leave an inheritance, not to their children, but to their grand children. This is really important because godly people know how to teach their kids to walk with God and to build the kingdom of God. So God's miracle working hand will increase the wealth from generation to generation. That's it, by the way, what godly people do. And that's part of the blessing is that your wealth will grow as time happens, but that only happens. Look in Genesis 28, really cool verse. Uh, uh, Isaac was about to die and he was praying with Jacob. He said, Isaac called to Jacob and he blessed him. He said, may God Almighty bless you and give you many children. And may your descendants multiply again, many children and many nations. But uh, look at the next one. It said, may God pass on to you and your descendants the blessing. Yeah. How do you pass the blessing from generation to generation? It's a really important question. How do you take your blessing and passing from generation to generation? How do you make sure that somehow the goodness and the purpose of God pass from generation to generation? Because it's really, really hard. How do you actually do that? I'm so grateful that from a young age, every time my dad gave me 20 bucks, he gave me $2 to put in the bucket for tithing. You know, even when I wasn't a Christian, I didn't really struggle with tithing. I never really found it a problem. Because my dad just is like, it's what you do, man. Come on. So good. And this is really important. How do you teach your children to receive the blessing of God and how to pass the blessing of God from generation to generation? For, parents, I'm not just talking to you. I'm not just asking you to die. I'm asking you to make your children die as well. Wow. I'm going the extra mile. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's good. I'm not just asking you to offer to the house of God the first, the tenth, and the best. Because look what, what Jacob replied. Jacob said, look when God appeared to him. Jacob said, again, this is really cool stuff. J Jacob replied to, he said, what an awesome place is this where God appeared to him. It is none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. God encounters Jacob and God gives him the land. The land was called Luz. And God told him, this is your land. Guess what Jacob did? Jacob changed the name to Bethel, meaning the house of the Lord. Wow. Jacob gave to God what God has given him. Wow. <laughs> so good. Good. It said he named the place Bethel, which means the house of God. And he said, this house of God is the very gateway to heaven. Can I tell you, blessing is found when you offer the house of God. Look, look, because look how he landed. He said, 
I've set up this place as a place of worshiping God and I'll present to God a tenth of everything that he gives me. It said, Jacob made a vow. If God will provide for me, if God will protect me, if God will give me back to the promised land, if God will take care of my children, then I will present to God a tenth of everything that has given. Because that's the thing about greedy people. They always use I, 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 my, 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 mine, mine, mine. Have you ever seen those people that I, I, every second word, I, 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 my, 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 my. Like I, I, my, my, it's like a Justin Bieber song, my, 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 my. That's how greedy people behave because they don't genuinely believe that what they have is actually because of the grace of God. They don't know that the health and the strength in your bones is actually a gift from God. If God removed his hand away from your health, you wouldn't have the money. They don't fully know, understand that the wisdom, the ideas, the skill, the work of your hand, your strategic mind, your smart mind, all the things that you can see, it's not actually you. It's the grace of God. So my money, my money, my money. I'm like, is it really your money? Or did God give it to you? We really have to establish this question because this is the issue with my, 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 I, I, They haven't established the truth and the reality that it's not your money. God just entrusted it to you. The job that you have and the wisdom that you have, it's not yours. God purposely gave you the grace to work, to think strategically. Can I uh, talk to some dads for a moment? For me, if you do not honor the Lord's first and best intent, I have no idea how you're going to lead your family in the future. I don't know because life is hard and you can lose your job, you can lose, you can lose everything. I have no idea how parents, particularly men that lead the household, how do you afford to not give the Lord? The first and tenth and the best. Right. How do you do it? And all my young adults, all my broke young adults, like Jacob, that was me like seven years ago when I started Echo Church, I had nothing. But all I knew, I just need to honor God. Yeah, That's the beauty of God. You don't need to be rich. You don't need to be smart. You don't need to be wise. All you need to do is honor God. And God has a way of getting you from broke to prosperous. Amen. God has a way of opening heaven. And that's the thing. You didn't really work for it. Wasn't it God's grace that gave that's right, that's right. the breath in your body yeah. and the strength in your bones? You really, really think, like have you been to the hospital and seen how many sick people for you to realize, oh man, if God removes my health, I can't make any money. If God removes my breath, right. I'm dead, obviously. If God removed his wisdom, if God removes his favor, I'm gone. I'm done. And again, this is the issue with greed. Greed is simply loving money more than God. It's not that you don't love God. It's you love God, but you love money more. This is the issue with this kind of little funny, funky sins that you can't say. It's not that you don't love God, because you worship, you come to church, you jump, you do a backflip, you come to the front, you do all these Christian shenanigans, but this is the issue with greed. It's it's not that you don't love God, it's that you love money more. Greed happens when you love money more than God, and greed happens when you love stuff more than people. Can I say one time? Greed happens when you love money more than God, and greed happens when you love stuff more than people. So you end up building your house by abandoning God's house and you end up building your family by not giving the first and tenth and the best to the house of the Lord. So you end up living for your purpose and you end up living for your idea. You end up living for your thing. And this is actually the condition of the last days that people will love themselves and their money too much. Look what Paul said. Paul said, you should know this tendency that the last days, they will be very, very difficult times. Why? People will only love their money. Sorry, people will only love themselves and their money. 
This is a condition of the last days, particularly in the church, that people will be so busy building their kingdom, building their ego, building their business, building their empire, that they will not build or offer anything to build the house of God. They will love God, but they will love their money more. They will love the church, but they will love their business more. And as a consequence, as a record, they will never ever offer the first and tenth and the best to build the purpose of God. They will just love themselves. I came across an interesting story of a young Indian beggar boy who used to always go to India, India, to an interesting country. You got the really rich side on one side and the really poor side on one side. So they would always cross to the rich place and that young boy would always go to a cafe where a, a rich ma old man would be eating his donuts and he'll be having his coffee and that young boy would go at the end of the day and the rich boy and the rich guy noticed him and he'll go to the bin and he'll find the burnt left over the toast and he will eat it and he'll bring his friend and they'll all share it and every single day that young poor boy will come until that uh, old rich man decided that I'm going to buy him a box of 10 donuts and give it to him. He gave it to him and the boy was so pumped and so excited. Anybody wants a donut? All right, Martin, you can have it. One more, Martina. All right, no problem. Anybody, another one? Sean? Make sure you tithe. No, no I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm watching you, man. No, I'm joking. You got a donut. That's people's tithing. No, I'm joking. No. It was such a sad story because the old man watched a young boy as he was eating and then his friend came. And he told him, hey, can I get a donut? And the boy was like, no, it's mine. <laughs> this is the condition of a lot of people in the house of God. And we're not talking about a box of donuts. We're talking about the infinite grace of God. We've been singing today, God, you have given me life. You have opened my eyes. I'm like, man, God got you. God saved you. Jesus died for your sin. Jesus didn't just give you anything. He gave you his life. He gave you himself for free, for free. If the people of the Old Testament gave 10% of their money to the house of God, how much more should the people of grace? How much more should the people of the New Testament, how much more should the people of Jesus, how much more should the people of the cross give? Yeah. Not tithing is a heart problem. Yeah. Yeah. Friend, seriously? God wants one donor wow. out of the 10? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Man, what is going on? Yeah. on. <laughs> Jesus died. The people of the Old Testament gave 28% of the income, 10% to tithing, 10% to the festivals in the temple, and 8% to the poor, the orphans, the refugees, and the widows. They offered an average of their income, 28%, 10% to be the house of God, 10% to expand the house of God forward in festival, and 5 to 8% to poor, orphans, widows, and refugees. And they were the people of the law. <laughs> One dollar out of ten, ten dollar out of hundred, hundred dollar out of one thousand. I remember when I got saved, like, man, how much money do you guys want? I didn't have much. I'm like, I'm keen, I'm ready, I'm ready. Ah, 50%, I'm ready. I'm like, 10%. I'm like, what? That's, by the way, exactly what happened with Jacob. Jacob, that was his moment of saving grace because he just ran after lying, deceiving. Yeah. And God saved him, called him, blessed him, and sent him. And Because that's the thing. Tithing is a spiritual moment of worship, not just a practical routine. Tithing is a natural response to being saved by the unlimited free grace of God. It is so big, it is so massive that what I give is so small, is so tiny. And that's why tithing is a heart problem. Show me your money and I'll show you your heart. Show me your wallet and I'll show you who you really are. And God doesn't want your money. God wants your heart. And his pathway to your heart is through your money. God doesn't want your money. God wants your desires. And his pathway to your heart is by breaking through your desires. And all my arrogant, prideful people, God doesn't need your money. God made the money. God doesn't actually need money. God does not need your money. God wants your money. Yeah. And Echo Church doesn't need your money. Echo Church needs God's money. Come on. Come on. 
how can you collide with the infinite grace of God and struggle? I'm struggling. I oh, really. You don't get it. How? You really don't get it. You actually don't get it. You, there is actually a critical, dangerous, deadly condition in your heart. Heart conditions are deadly, spiritually and physically. Do you understand that issue, friend? If you have a heart condition of greed, it's a deadly thing. Heart conditions are deadly, not just practically, but spiritually. Not just medically, but biblically. You are in a really big problem. You are about to die. I'm not sure what this even means. Your spirit, your soul is in a really, really dangerous place and you don't even know it. You have a serious heart sickness. You have a serious sickness in your spirit of greed. And this is the problem of greed is that when you have it, you don't know it. It's an invisible sin. It's one of these conditions that you will not get it until someone tells you about it. You will not get it until you read the word of God, until you're like, man, this is crazy. I thought I was generous, but I'm greedy. See, God told me that this sermon doesn't have a goal of forcing you to give. God wants you to want to give. I'm not trying to manipulate you emotionally for you to tithe. I'm trying to transform your mind to get what God is really all about. I'm not trying to force you to tithe. I'm trying to change your heart because freely you have received. So freely give. And if you're greedy, you will misinterpret my sermon sermon on purpose because when you're sick, you pass your sickness to other people. You'll project wow. your greedy condition on me. And that's the issue. God doesn't need your money, but God wants your money. God wants your money because God wants your heart. God wants your money because God wants you. And his pathway to your heart, his pathway to your desire is through your money. So God wants your money, not because he wants your money. God wants your money because he wants you. So show me your money. I'll show you your heart. Show me your wallet. I'll show you who you really are. And money is the best way for you to know the real actual condition of your soul. And money is the best way for you to actually know the actual condition of your spirit. You know, and the pastor, according to the Bible, the best way for me to know the condition and the health and the soul and the spirit of the church is to look at the offering, not attendance. Attendance doesn't really mean anything. People come, they clap, they sing. It doesn't cost them anything. They put their bum on the seat. They get it sweaty and they go home. It doesn't really mean anything. Some of them break the chairs. Don't break the chair, please. One of the interesting things about our modern era when it comes to raising chicken, anybody here has chicken in their house? Any of my organic people, they only ate organic chicken. So expensive, I'm trying to get some. But one of the interesting things about chicken is that, it was gonna come on the screen, is that as you get chicken, in order for you to get, produce it really fast, you have to inject it with steroids, number one, and you have to manipulate time by putting the light on, off and on really, really quickly. So in order to get the chicken to grow really quickly, you inject it with steroids so it can actually grow really quickly. And then you turn the light on really, really quick so the brain thinks it's night and day and night and day. And before you know what's supposed to take a few months, for the chicken to grow, it takes a few days. Or even a few, yeah, I think a few days. But what's interesting is the chicken grows through the steroid and time manipulation. The one or two things that don't grow as the body grows is actually the heart. So science is able to manipulate time and inject steroids to make the body grow, but the heart doesn't grow. And this is the problem as the chicken grows is that they can can live, but they can't walk and they're paralyzed and they're dysfunctional. See, that is the condition of the church when God blesses its body to grow and exploit but it heart doesn't move. Because catch this, catch this. You need to catch this. God will make the body grow. That's his promise. But God will not make the heart grow because that's you. Yeah. Our church in the last few years, again, when the chicken doesn't, because the chicken has a small heart and small feet, they can't move. They can't operate. So they're dysfunctional. They die of heart attack, at least half of them and then they're paralyzed and they can't walk. That's the exact condition of the church. When the church grows in number, but it does not grow in offering. Wow. 
Yeah. Really, really important. So our church in last year, we have doubled in attendance, we have doubled in service, we have doubled in crews, we have doubled in kids, we have doubled in influence. But in accordance to the same time last year, we haven't doubled financially. Obviously, because we've had so many new people jump. Like from 20, 2021 to 2022, we doubled. Now in the 2022 to 2023, we doubled. Now we are in the season where we're going to have to decide, is this a revival or is this a dead church? Because again, you got to understand, God will make the body grow. But it's my responsibility as the pastor and the leader and the shepherd of the church to prompt, to convict, to pierce your heart. To make the heart grow. So how do you know the condition and the health of a church? Get the total attendance, get the total giving, divided by the total attendance. And you will fully know. If, if it's like $10 per head, you're like, yeah, there's no way every person at church earns 100 bucks a week. No way. And, and that's how you know the condition of the people of God. It's really, really important. And we are now in that moment where we get to decide, are we a revival or are we a dead church? It's again, this is the reason we purposely do this at the beginning of the year, because this will determine, and I know that like, God is moving, we're gonna double offering in the next week, I know that. I'm not even worried, God has done it. Echo Church in the last three years have doubled in attendance and in offering every single year, every single year. Since COVID, we have doubled, at least doubled every single year in attendance, in crews, in influence, in kids, and in tithing. The general management of the church weekly. That's actually what happened. But this is a moment where I have to push, teach, and grow these people's heart. Because as we move in next year, as we talk, look here, there will not be enough place. Just look behind you. Like this morning, the service was full. We started that service six months ago, that morning one. And it's already full. There's two rows to go. And this service is two to three rows to go. We're about to go to start our third service. And guess what's next? We're out of here. We are really close by the same time next year to be starting making the plans. All right, where's the next building? Where's the next location? And that's what ha- the condition of the heart. It will determine a revival or a dead church. It will determine a church that is on the move or a church that is paralyzed. It will determine a church where God is moving in or a church that is dead. And that's the problem with Christendom or my big corporation church like Anglican, Catholic, all that stuff. They're supplied top down, not bottom up. And they end up attacking the church like, oh, the church asked for money. I'm like, because we are not an institutional church. We're a people-centered church. People get saved, so people give. We're not funded by the government. We're not funded by some work bill. We're not funded by anybody. We are funded by the people who God changed your life, who God prompted their heart. We are funded by people starving every single week. And that is why church is so dangerous. <laughs> you have, you know, if you don't tax, you go to jail. If you don't tithe, you don't go to jail. <laughs> but people still do it. <laughs> So our goal is not a big body church, but a big heart church. Our goal is not a full service church, but a faithful church. Our goal is not a church that's full of seeds, but a church that is full of souls on fire for God. Our goal is not quantity, but quality. And that is the reason I'm offending you tonight. And that's the reason I'm like, like last year, some rich guy who doesn't come to church anymore, um, he went back to me, like, like, I don't mind tithing, but I don't like the way you speak about it. It just so judgmental. It made me feel so condemned. Like, that's so judgmental. And I'm like, I'm like dude, you have a greed issue. You have a greed issue. And that person was really, really rich. Like, he was on the four figure tithing weekly. Why I know? Because he texted me when he died. Like, cool, you don't need to tell me. And, and I knew you, you, you have a problem. And, and the richer people, you will have a problem giving than the, than the poorer people. This is a biblical issue in the Bible that the more you have, the more you struggle to give. And the more people that, uh, uh, the more you have, the more you struggle to give. But the people that are struggling financially tend to be the ones that less struggle to give. Yeah. That's why, that's why when the young rich ruler, when Jesus told him, come and follow me, he said that he left because he had so much stuff. More people in third world countries tithe. Did you know that? More people in the third world countries tithe. 
And people in the, the average giving in the Western world is 2.5. Wow. The average giving in third world countries is like at least 10%. Wow. Can you believe it? Wow. Four times. You know, before World War II, during the Great Depression, giving was double what is now. Because the more you have, the more you will struggle to tithe. I'm telling you right now, the, 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 the more God gives you, some people come tell me, you know, I, I can't tithe because it's so much. I'm like, cool, I'm going to pray for God to give you less. <laughs> and I understand that, you man, your tithing can buy another house. Your tithing can pay your mortgage. Your tithing can extend your business. Your tithing can buy another car. Your tithing can get on holiday. I know and I get it. Your tithing is so much. But that's what greed does. That's, that's the problem of greed. That, you struggle to give. You struggle to give. So the question now becomes, are you going to live under an open heaven or under a sharp ground? Are you going to pass to generational blessing from generation to generation? Or is it going to end with you? I'm so grateful that my dad, he gave me this $2 every week and I chucked in the bucket every single week in kid again and again, again. A few years later, I got my first job. I was a waiter in like a fair field or something. I got getting 13 bucks an hour. The first time I had to tie with 130 bucks that worked, you know, 10 hours. I'm like, I need to start $13. I ended up tithing 15. I'm like, you know what, round it up, why not? I never struggled with that concept. Because my parents taught me that God is my provider. And that's exactly what Isaac, what Jacob, what Abraham did. He said, may God bless you. May His hand be with you. May His favour shine upon you. May the God who has been my shepherd all the days of my life till this very day, may it provide for you and bless you and your family and your children and their children and their children.